Thank you very much. Um, the two lectures that I'm going to deliver today and tomorrow uh, are based on a joint work with my friend and co-author Michael Richter. Michael is actually sitting here, but my uh, tradition is that when I have a paper with this co-authored with somebody that I show the picture. In, so this is a picture of our lab. A lab, of course, is a cafe. And uh, this case is a cafe in uh, East London where actually some of the ideas of this paper were developed. You wonder who is Michael here? So here is Michael. So um, let me, I don't like introductions, uh, but I do want to put you into the mood of the paper. And uh, so let's, let's go into this picture. What you have here is connect yourself with the last family feast that you had. And uh, imagine there is a main course. In the main course, there is no economics. Uh, grandma or grandfather came and put on your dish the main portion, and you had to eat it. No question, you could not li leave it. You have to eat it. Nothing, no economics. The economics starts when, and excuse me of being not politically correct, where the grandma comes with the delicious pie, traditional delicious pie, that everybody here, believe me, there are 18 figures here in the family, so everybody in the 18 people like the, 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 the pie. Maybe that some are in diet, it's not very important. But let's say that everybody is not in diet, everybody likes as much as possible from the pie. Now, here we are in economics. Why we get into economics? Because of, I think, the traditional definitions of economics is that we talk about situations where there are scarce resources, there is only one pie, and there are conflict of interest. I want the pie, Eric wants the pie, she wants the pie. There is conflict, so that's economics. Now, how do economic institutions, traditional economics, deal with that? Number one, auction. I hope very much in your family, nobody does an auction when you split the pie among the members of the family. Number two, probably trade. Namely, everybody gets some portion of the pie and people start to trade. Again, I hope very much that's not the main, the way that your family is dealing with this situation. So, so it's economics and there's no prices and no game theory, but something happens. And something happens, and uh, let me suggest, uh, let we suggest something that happens, uh, which is uh, people have some view about what they can consider to take. I guess nobody in the family is considering taking one half of the pie, although he's very much willing to do it. So there is some concept, there is some norm, if you want, about what I consider and what, I, what is not done, what is permissible, and what is forbidden. Forbidden not because there is a police, there is a grandma, but she's not a policeman, woman. And, 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 but there is some sort of a concept, what is done and what is not done. Maybe the, some of you already want to throw on me some tomato, but I guess that until this moment, nobody thought about it. So there is some sort of restrictions that come somehow emerged into what is done, what is not done, what is forbidden, and what is permissible. So, for example, what happens if, because of some reasons, everybody believes that, uh, uh, that he can take, uh, can consider to take up to 10% of the pie? Well, there are 18 people here. It's a tragedy. 10 people take, some people don't get it. Disaster, family disaster. What will happen next year? The year after, I think people will understand that the norm has to adjust, and probably they will take less than 10%. Probably they take 2%. If they are very modest and take only 2%, then the outcome is that there is much left over. And uh, then nothing happens, that's fine. Uh, grandma is probably a little bit disappointed, but not so much. And then uh, not as much as she would be uh, angry if some people would not be satisfied. And then the after, the norm will go up. When more or less the norm is to take more or less 1 divided by n of the pi, then things are fine, things are fine. And uh, what people want to take indeed is feasible to be taken. And second, you cannot relax this norm. You cannot relax this norm and allow more than one divided by 18 without a catastrophe happens. That's basically the idea of the paper. That something, this is not prices, 
These are just some sort of norm about permissible and not permissible, that uh, uh, permissible and forbidden, that somehow brings, and this is the word that we will use a lot, harmony into the society, into this, what we will call economy. Okay, so let me be more formal, of course, and uh, let me talk about the notion of what we call economy. Economy for us is, now it become formal, don't worry, it will not be too formal, um, but it will be precise as I can. Uh, so what we call economy is the following model. There is a set of agents, of course, and agents. There is a set of personal alternatives. These are personal alternatives, it's not a social choice problem. The set X is a set of alternatives. People have, every I has some preference relation over X. Notice it's over X. I care only about what I do, what I eat. I don't care about other. That immediately makes the situation not a standard game. It's not a game because I don't care about the, the operations, not directly at least, on the, on the act, alter, alter, cho choices of the other people. A profile, what is a profile? It's a profile, a profile of alternatives. What I choose, what he chooses, what she chooses. And now, where is the feasibility? What are the constraints? The constraints are modeled here as a set F, F for feasibility, F, a set F of what? Of profiles. So these are the sets of the profiles that can be done, can be, can be executed. Okay? So, uh, examples. Um, uh, well, the, 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 the most obvious one is the division. That's more or less imagine as was box or something like that. There is some bundle, endowment, omega or W, that can be split among the N uh, people. Everybody can choose the bundle, and the feasibility constraint is the sum of the bundles that are chosen is equal to W. That's the standard way that you studied price theory. Give and take, that's my favorite economy. That's an economy which is less standard in economics. It's uh, people can take and people can give. Positive, I take, I have more. My, negative, I give. I can give some time, of, a portion of my time in life or, or some resources that I have. But you cannot take if somebody does not give. So the sum of the give and take has to be equal to zero. That's the constraint. That's the give and take economy. The roommate. The roommate is a story that we have to split into two rooms of two. If I choose Eric, Eric has to choose me. That's the feasibility constraint. Consensus. That's a society where people must agree. Why do they have to agree? Because they have to agree. If they don't disagree, then the society collapses. I know some societies like that. Uh, uh, so here there is a set of positions, let's say political positions, and the feasibility is feasibility in the sense that if it's not done, something terrible happens, harmony is destroyed, then they have to choose the same thing. And finally, keep connectivity. In the papers, by the way, you will find many more examples, but keep connectivity, that's the idea here. There is some, let's say, geography. You have to choose a location. I want to live in Jerusalem. He wants to live in Tel Aviv. She wants to live in London. But the problem is that because the, the big enemy, whoever you imagine he is, is going to battle us, and we, live, we have to live close together, close enough so that when he comes, this enemy, we will be able to defend one another. So the distance between any two locations have to be less than some, let's say, one. That's the feasibility constraint in this story. Not, econo not a standard economic story, but still we call it an economy. Now, what is the standard way that you think about economics uh, in, uh, in microeconomics model? I guess uh, that's my picture. Michael has nothing to do with this picture, my responsibility. So you have here the, the, the individuals, and you have here, um, and in the, in the, here they have preferences about bundles or whatever. And the picture that we have is that they, some of them have some budget constraints, and the budget constraints determine the budget sets and determine they choose the best for themselves. This is the XI. And somehow the feasibility is that somehow the sum of the XI is to be equal to W, or the set or the profile has to be in the feasibility set. What is the standard solution? The standard solution here is that there are some prices that somehow determine the budget set, and they, they, they move and move until they settle in the way that exactly the XI, the profile of choices, is, is, is feasible. That's right. Who is determined the prices? Well, you have heard about it. 
that's some uh, invisible end, namely, I don't know. Somebody determines the fun. That's the picture, more or less, that we have in mind. What is the picture that, uh, sorry, that usually we play in economics with? What is the, the, the picture that we have in mind? And by the way, before I move to it, let me just a personal note. You see, I, I already was very proud about this picture. Uh, so, uh, do you know who did this picture? It's not Picasso, although it's 1957, it's me. And this is the picture from 2019. <laughs> and as you see, it's almost the same, just a little bit decline. <laughs> Okay, so that's the picture that we have, Michael and me, about economics. We have, again, the, 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 the individuals, and they have preferences, and they can do, and the, but, but this time, the, the set of the actions, the set X, is split into, divided into permissible set and forbidden. Again, forbidden not because it's forbidden by police, but it's forbidden because it's, un, it's undone. And now, what is special about the set B? The set B is determined in a way that the optimal choices of the individuals are such that what happens is feasible. That's not the whole story. Uh, we will, uh, you will see that there will be some additional element in a second. But, uh, but, uh, but of course, who determines this? The same guy, the same invisible hand. So as you see, and that's I would like to emphasize already, what we want to do in this model is to build a model which in some sense, it's closer to competitive equilibrium, to general equilibrium model than to game theory, in the sense, but there are no prices. It's, there is something is determined. Some, something is determined by the invisible end that brings harmony into the society. And this something is the split of the alternatives, the individual and the alternatives that people can do between what is done and what is not done. Um, let me move to the definition of equilibrium right away. So, uh, first of all, what is a candidate to equilibrium? A candidate to equilibrium is a pair. Let's go through it carefully. The first element is the set Y. Usually, what is equilibrium? Price vector and a set of choices, a profile of choices. In this case, the prices, no prices, but the prices are, are, are replaced by a set Y. And sorry, by a set Y, and the set Y, this is the set of permissible alternatives. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, <coughs> that's what, uh, and the set Y, of course, is a subset of the set X. This is a candidate for equilibrium. What is the para Y equilibrium? The para sorry, a para Y equilibrium is a configuration that satisfies. The following, the standard, <coughs> the standard uh, equilibrium uh, conditions, namely that every action that is the action that is assigned to agent I is indeed the best for him according to his preferences from the set, from among the set Y. Number two, feasibility. The profile is indeed in the set F. This is what we call a para Y equilibrium. But we are going to talk, already I mentioned that there is another force when we talked about the grandma pie, that one force is that there is a possibility that what is allowed is such that the outcome is that the optimal choices, the profile of the optimal choices is not feasible. There is another possibility, which is in the story of the grandma, that what is allowed is only to take 2% and actually there is a leftover. So the constraint, namely that I cannot take 3% of the pie, is not necessary. Our philosophy, if you want, our view of the world in this case is that things that are constraints that are not needed are going to be loosened. I, I, you know, I, I served in the army for uh, some time and I remember the fences in some borders that nobody was, were actually were uh, just left from, from previous uh, uh, periods and, uh, and, and the fences were actually, everybody could pass the fence. It was not needed. It's loose. If you, something is not needed, some constraint, rest, restriction is not needed, it's, it's, it's relaxed. And that's the, actually what the difference between para y equilibrium and y equilibrium. Y equilibrium is a para y equilibrium that is also immune to the possibility that we can relax the, the constraint in a way that will not cause a catastrophe. What does it mean does not cause a catastrophe? Namely, there is no Y equilibrium is a para Y equilibrium such that there is no larger Y equilibrium, larger in the 
uh, in the um, superset uh, sense that is uh, consistent with para y equilibrium. Clear? Let's train ourselves on the definitions and go back to, uh, uh, to uh, oh, before we go back to the grandma, let's just uh, go through simple examples. This is the housing um, uh, economy. The housing economy, there are two agents here. There are five houses. The constraint is that no two people should live in the same house, should choose the same house. If they choose, a war, not good. Uh, what you have here is a para-equilibrium. What is allowed, you can settle only in D and E. One chooses D, two chooses E. It's feasible, therefore it's Y equilibrium. It's, sorry, it's a para Y equilibrium. It's not a Y equilibrium because here for, it's forbidden to settle in A, B, C, and if we, I relax it and I, we allow also B and C, nothing happens. Namely, one chooses B, two chooses C, everybody's more happy, and, and it's also para Y equilibrium. Therefore, this is not a Y equilibrium and uh, sorry, and because there is another para equilibrium which is larger. Is it a Y equilibrium? Yes, because the only possibility now to expand the set is to include also A in the set of the permissible. And if I include A in the set, everybody wants to live in, the, in heaven, and, 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 and that's not good, mm -hmm. right? And therefore, the fact that A is a taboo and you're not supposed to live in A is necessary to not to have a catastrophe in the society. So therefore, this is actually, of course, the unique Y equilibrium in this example. Does equilibrium always exist? Does it solve any conflict? Of course not. That's, that's nonsense. Uh, just a simple example. Let's say that in the same economy, the two agents have the same preferences. If you have the same preferences, actually there is no para Y equilibrium. Because whatever is the set of permissible, then the two guys will choose the same thing. And this is in, it, that's contradicting feasibility. Don't worry, we will come also to existing theorems, but of course, just to say, of course, it not, does not resolve any conflict of this type. Let's go back to the grandma pie. So now again, because it's very simple, but just to make sure that we understand the concept and, and follow the logical uh, uh, moves that we need to do. So in this economy, in the single pie economy, then uh, there is only one equilibrium, and the equilibrium is that the set Y is between zero and one divided by N, and everybody is choosing one divided by N. Of course, again, assuming that nobody is in diet, a diet, if there is a diet, then it will be adjusted accordingly. Step one, uh, first of all, this configuration is Y equilibrium. Why? Because everybody chooses one divided by N. This is feasible, right? So that's a para Y equilibrium. Step two, notice that the para any para equilibrium cannot uh, contain a point above one divided by n, because once there is a point above the one divided by n, that everybody chooses strictly above the one divided by n, and that's of course a configuration which is impossible. Therefore, uh, 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 this configuration is number one. It's a Y equilibrium because you cannot expand it further, right? Number two, it's, only unique. it's also unique, because any para y equilibrium will be a subset of this set. And therefore, since it's a subset of this set, it cannot be a y equilibrium unless it is itself. So these are just, it's a very trivial uh, consider, uh, move, but the moves are, these are the basic, actually, moves that you will need to do in other examples if you want to, choose, to prove that something is a unique equilibrium. Uh, okay, now what can be done? What can be done in some, in some con con with such concept? Number one, we can prove theorems. Number two, we can give examples. Personally, I have to admit I prefer examples, but I want also to demonstrate that we have power, we can show also some propositions. So I, I, I just want to show you one proposition. Uh, um, I don't like this... Uh, this norm now in a profession that we bring proposition without proofs. Uh, I think that our generation was used to other norms. Uh, but uh, but uh, I, I, so at least I would like to bring one proof in full details uh, so that you will see what are the sort of arguments that we bring. Okay, so, we, uh, uh, so that's the, 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 the proposition that I will fully prove. First of all, just to remind you a concept that I'm sure that you know about, which is uh, envy free. What is envy free? Envy free is a profile such that I don't envy you, you don't envy me. No, I envy the, the action of, of agent J. That's envy free. 
Now, the first thing, of course, that one can think, ask about is, is this equilibrium, uh, the concept that we have, is it Pareto efficient? Well, actually, I forgot to mention it, but in the example that we have seen already with the A, B, C, D, E, then actually the outcome was not efficient because this A could be given to one of the two agents. So this was Pareto dominating profile. So the outcome can be not Pareto efficient. So it's not Pareto efficient necessarily, but now comes something which is a little bit like, uh, like, uh, like the, the, the welfare theorems adjusted to this uh, uh, framework, which is the following. A profile is y equilibrium outcome if and only if it is Pareto stable. By the way, I'm using it as something Pareto stable because I hate the Pareto optimality concept. But so some, some, some slides, I still use the Pareto stable, but everything is the same. Okay, Pareto stable, Pareto optimality, Pareto efficiency is the same. Okay, so it's Pareto efficient among all feasible envy free profiles. So it's not Pareto efficient, but it's Pareto efficient among the envy free free profiles. A proof, full proof. Number one, let's say that this is a profile of uh, this is a, pro a profile of equilibrium outcome. Okay, so what you have this is the profile x1, x2, x3, and this is the set y. I would like to show that this is Pareto efficient among all feasible NV3 profiles. Let's say that there is another, there, let's say that there is another profile which Pareto dominating, which is NV3, and Pareto dominating the XI. Okay, here it is on the, on this, on the slide. To get a contradiction, I have to get a contradiction to the assumption that originally the XI is an outcome of, of, uh, of Y equilibrium. How to get this by showing now if it's Pareto, if, if it's uh, the, the ZI Pareto dominating the XI, so it must be that for one of the guys, ZI is strictly better than XI, therefore ZI cannot be in the set, right? So one of the ZI, at least one of the ZI, are outside the set. Maybe some of them are in the set, but at least one of them is outside the set. Why? So what we do. So what we do, we expand the set, so we include not now in the set Y also the members of ZI. Some of them may be already in the set, but at least one of them is outside. So we strictly expanded the set. Now we claim that the set Z with the ZI is a, a para-equilibrium, and it's a larger set. Why it's a para-equilibrium? Why Z1 is, is optimal? Z1 is optimal because it's NV3, so it's better than C3 or any other ZI, it's better than X, X1, at least weekly, and therefore it's better than any other member of the set Y. So therefore Z1 is optimal in the set Z, right? So therefore it's, 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 it's feasible because we, we, um, um, we, we started with the set Z to, uh, the profile Z to be feasible, feasible in the free profile, so it's feasible and it's optimal in the set Z, and therefore it's a larger, para equilibrium, and therefore that's contradicting the assumption that we started with a Y equilibrium. Clear? The other side, let's say that this is a, a profile which is Pareto efficient among all feasibly MV3 profiles, and then I have to show that this is indeed also equilibrium outcome. What do I need to include in the set? Of course I have to include in the set XIs. They are feasible by some, somebody chooses it, so it must be in the set. I also can include any element which is uh, uh, which is inferior to, for, from the point of view of I to XI. There is no reason, if, X, if everybody prefers XI to A, there is no reason not to forbid it, right? And this will be the candidates for my set, the set Y. Now I have to show that this is equilibrium outcome. Of course, it's a, it's a, it's a, of course it is a para-equilibrium because XI is better, it's NV3, so X1 is better than X3. It's also better than the ABC because that's the way that it's, the ABC are inferior for everybody. Uh, and now why it cannot be expanded? It cannot be expanded because if it could be expanded, then what we would get, if it could be expanded, there must be another element which is not in the set. And if it could be expanded, then we would get, since it's not in the set, that it must be that for one of the guys, it's actually, it's not in the ABC. So for one of the guys, it's actually an action which is not inferior to the action that he's supposed to take. 
This means that for, in this case, number three is a guy that actually we, uh, we added some element, which is uh, the element which we added is better for him than X3. And therefore, what he is choosing is something which is strictly better than X3. For the other guys, it could be the same or it could be in the elements Y. But in any case, what we got is, again, we got a free, uh, um, MV3 profile, which strictly, uh, which Pareto dominates the, the, the XI, and that's contradicting to the assumption that this was a, a Pareto efficient among all feasible NV3 profiles. So that's a basic proposition that we have. Um, some propositions are more complicated, but that's basically the type of reasoning or thinking or arguing that we have. Example, two pies. Sorry. Michael and me, we call it the kosher economy. Uh, that's because you might know Orthodox Jews cannot eat uh, milk and uh, meat together, so they cannot also put them on the same table, but let's put it aside. <laughs> so in that, uh, so you, you can think about it as a pie in Oxford and a pie in Cambridge. You cannot eat the same, the same, the same time a pie in both places. Uh, whatever. Imagination carries you too. Okay, so the story here is that there are two pies, and you can take only one portion, you can take a portion from one of the two sides, one of the two pies. So you have to choose the pie and how much you take from the pie. Uh, so the set X, if you want, is the set is the, the in R2 plus, but it's only the excess. Right? It's only the excess, only A0 or 0 B. Uh, feasibility, people take the sum of what they take is more, not more than one comma one. Clear? Now, I will, uh, the proof, I must say, I, we like it, the proof, but uh, it's a little involved and we don't have enough time, of course. So let me just, in this case, draw, immediately explain the, the equilibrium. There is here a unique equilibrium, and the equilibrium looks more or less like that. N not more or less, exactly like that. Namely, what is the feature? The feature, one of the pi is exhausted. It cannot be that in equilibrium, the two pies are leftovers. Why? Because if there are two leftovers, then you can, it's not so trivial, but you can adjust actually what is permitted here and there in a way that actually you can expand both, you can relax the restrictions. But I should say, of course, what is equilibrium? Equilibrium is how much you can take from this pie and how much you can take from this pie. Uh, okay, so one pie is ex 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 exploited. The, uh, fully ex consumed. The other one, not necessarily. So there might be that there is some leftover. But the leftover, so in some sense it could be, it's inefficient. But isn't it slightly inefficient? What sense it's slightly inefficient? In the sense that the portion of the leftover, it must be smaller than what is permitted to take from this pie. So in this case, it's 30, you're permitted to take 30% of the pie, the leftover must be below 30%. Now, why that sometimes is necessary? You can say, okay, if there is leftover, why not to expand what is permitted from the gray pie? Because it must be that if this is the configuration of equilibrium, it must be that one of the guys in, that takes the green pie is indifferent between the green and the blue and the, the gray. Otherwise, you can increase indeed the gray until the point that one of the guys here is. is, is, is. Now, if the slice was large, if you, if you increase the gray, then it will jump. It will jump, but there is not enough for him to take from them. If the situation was that the leftover was more than what is permitted from the gray, then indeed we could move, we could increase the attractiveness of the gray until the point that one of the guys here is indifferent and we move it to the left. And then we would be again in a situation that there are leftovers from the same, t the two pies, and you could increase both a little bit in a coordinated way to, to, to make it feasible. So that's an example that actually it's not efficient again in a very clear way, but you can actually in some sense say it's almost efficient in the sense that we described here. Okay, this proof of course is gone. And now in economics, up to now, the set X did not have any structure. We like to work without structures. Uh, but 
most of economics is restructures, and usually the set X is, is, is inside some Euclidean space, right? And that's what we will talk about now. Uh, so, um, uh, so uh, first, I, I will not prove it, but I'm sure uh, you are very much uh, eager uh, to know about existence. So here is an example to existence theorem here. If, this, if you have an economy where the set X is a closed convex subset of some Euclidean space, very standard uh, uh, assumptions in economics, if the preference are continuous and strictly convex and differentiable, again, quite standard. If the feasibility set is closed, convex, and closed under permutation, that's actually less naive than it looks, because closed under permutation means that we can replace uh, seats, but uh, the, the convexity of the set F means that, uh, that actually there is also one of the one of the out, one of the profits which is feasible is a constant. And that actually exactly something that was missing in the example of the counterexample to existence in the discrete case, actually there was no possibility that there is some action, some house that we both can live in. So actually from this point of view, it's not, it's not naive uh, assumption, and that's what actually causes us to be able to prove that in such standard situation, then in, indeed Y equilibrium, not only para, but Y equilibrium exist. But look, up to now, um, I like to work more than with existence. I like to work with structures. And the structure one, I actually noticed that up to now, the set, y, the, the set Y that we constructed was just a set. It was very much attached to the, it was very much relying on the particular details of the preferences. Uh, and uh, we are going to use the Euclidean space here actually to, 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 to bring some more structure to the, to the equilibrium notion. And let me explain. But let me motivate it by the following. You've seen it? You've seen something like that? It does not sound, you, nobody laugh, right? That it sounds reasonable, you know, uh, some roads you can, uh, you can, there is speed limit of 70, but you must at least 45, otherwise it's bad. Clear? Now imagine also, that's country one. Country two, you have something like that. Namely, it's allowed between 10 and 25 and between 40 and 70. You should laugh. <laughs> now, don't laugh too much because, because actually what good thing about human beings is that everything has an exception. And indeed, I took this from Estonia. In Estonia, that's the limits on the ice in the winter. Be careful, I'm not responsible. <laughs> Uh, but, 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 but still, it sounds to us quite, not crazy, but very strange, right? Because I think that here what we have is that when we think about forbidden and, 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 and permissible, we think about it, if this is permissible and this is permissible, why not that something between is permissible? What is between here? Convexity. Right? Uh, what we th when we think about uh, forbidden, when we think about extremes, right? And that's, of course, what brings us to the definition, uh, which we think that it's also a, a, some expression of simplicity, which is another notion that I would like, in some sense, to... Uh, we have, at least, we, in the back of our mind, that the set Y should be simple. Now, what does it mean, simple, in such a context? I think that reasonable or simple in this context is it's not a better assumption to assume that the set Y set of the permissible set should be convex. And if the set Y is convex, then again, convex equilibrium, the same as before, but just the set Y has to be convex. A power equilibrium, sorry, it has to be convex. What is convex Y equilibrium? It's the same thing, but now the, the expansion must be also convex. So it's not any expansion that is not, uh, for, uh, it's, not does, it's conflicting with, with feasibility, but it's a convex, another convex set that, is, that is, cannot uh, be consistent with the feasibility constraint. And uh, now, again, proposition. So uh, we'll skip on that. Uh, you see even its own lemma is called in one point to, to help. Uh, it's not very deep, but it's, uh, you can, uh, in particular, you can, 
actually I skipped actually something which I wanted to show that actually uh, under the certain assumptions which are more or less the standard assumptions than existence uh, actually this is analogous to the first proposition uh, this is actually what I wanted to show that, the, that under some assumptions uh, don't read it uh, under some assumptions the, the existence uh, of y equilibrium, convex y equilibrium is also guaranteed, and these are more or less the standard assumptions that we have about economic environments like that. But the proposition that I want actually to talk about is this one, and this is a proposition about the structure. And I would like to claim now that the assumption about convexity of the y equilibrium does apply some simplicity of the y, the set y, which we like at least. And let me explain. Don't read the proposition, just look at the picture. So let's say that this is equilibrium. This is equilibrium, namely, I, I, well, I did not specify the set Y, but these are the choices of the five guys. Okay, they choose Y, one, one, two, out uh, to five. Let's say that one, two, and one, four are in, the, the, it's the best and the best. That's the set, from the set X, this is the best options. For, one, for agent uh, one, for example, it's not the case. And actually, uh, it's not the case. And uh, actually, uh, this is not the optimal. And this is, uh, he has a convex preferences, so this is, the, this, is the, uh, this is the upper contour of his preferences. So he prefers the, up, the alternatives in this set. This means that the set Y should not include anything else here. And of course, it's true about the other agents as well. But furthermore, it cannot include, uh, so the set Y must include, of course, the Y1 to Y5, but it cannot include the point which is above, let's say, this line. It cannot include the point above, because if it does include the point here, now because of the convexity of the set, it will include any point between this and Y1, and therefore, because of the differentiability, it also will include the point which is strictly better than Y1. Therefore, the set Y must be included be below H1, below H2, ABA3, below H5. So it must be, therefore, the set Y must be a part of this set, and, it, uh, 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 and uh, we argue that it's going to be exactly the green set. Why? It is exactly the green set, because the green set is a, y, is a para Y equilibrium. It's a power y equilibrium, but the y equilibrium must be inside this intersection. Let me repeat. Because the argument before, then the set y in the power y equilibrium, in the y equilibrium, which is also a power y equilibrium, must be inside the set, the green set. And, and, and since the green set itself is also a power y equilibrium, then the y equilibrium must be exactly this. Which means what? It means that the convexity here buys us that the, the structure of the equilibrium is relatively simple, relatively simple in the sense that it is described by linear inequalities. And again, you, you may argue about it, but I think that it's a, when we talk about simplicity, of course we don't have here a very, very natural uh, 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 meaning of uh, or definition of, con of simplicity of a set, but I, I hope that you agree with me that relatively, at least you have some sort of feeling instinct that when, if the set Y is described by a set of linear inequalities, and the set actually is, the number of the inequalities is not larger than the number of the agents. It's at most, it has n inequalities, then this is relatively a, 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 an expression of simplicity of the set Y. Okay, now I promise you examples, so let's go through examples. And in this example, what I want also to do is to compare it this approach with, uh, with game theory. So I was insisting in the, in the heading, in the title of the lecture, there is no games. Uh, why I, we do it without games? Because, to be honest, because well, I'm a little fed up with game theory. <laughs> I think that uh, game theory did, uh, the victory of game theory is, is, is too, too victorious. Namely, the, when we started our career, I think that uh, general equilibrium was uh, everything. And uh, now, towards the end of our career, it's game theory is everything. And I think uh, this is a mistake. 
uh, namely this is a bunch of models, this is a bunch of models, and what actually the target of this lecture is to say, we could think about other models, and these are models, and uh, there is no two model, and, uh, and uh, this is fun, this is fun, this is fun, choose whatever you want. Uh, so, but still I would like also to compare the, 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 this uh, solution with some, which how would a game theoretician would detect this problems and we will do it, we did it in another paper that I will not talk about here, but let me just demonstrate it on three examples that I would like to close actually the lecture with. So let's start with the consensus game. So here actually there is, let's say, the set of positions are between left and right, let's say zero uh, LR, and uh, the, what you see here are agents with, uh, so what is the strict convexity here means? It's single peakedness, right? So everybody, these are the peaks of the positions of the guys. And now um, each agent is, uh, and now notice now, unlike most of the political economy models where actually we, you're interested in the outcome of the process, here people have, um, uh, actually what they care about is the positions that they express. What is important for me is that extreme, you know, there are some models in uh, political economy by downs, I think, that also included actually the position inside the preferences of the politician or whatever. In this case, we go all the way to the extreme. I don't care about the outcome in the political sense. I care about what the positions that I, I, I express. Nevertheless, if there is no consensus, there is no, there is no party, there is no parliament, there is no jury, there is no whatever no family, so we have to get to a consensus. Okay, uh, so, uh, so, okay, so that's the economy. Now, is this equilibrium? Uh, yes, so if uh, there is one position which is allowed, only one position which is allowed, the, the, the purple one, that's the only thing that is permitted, and it's this position is between the left ish and the right ish, that everybody does not have any other choice but to choose the, the, the purple. There is a consensus. And so every point like that is a Y equilibrium. Is this equilibrium? No, this is not equilibrium. Here only the very rightish position is allowed. Everybody chooses it. It's, y, it's a para Y equilibrium, but it's not equilibrium because you can expand it. I can expand it to be something like that. This is also Y equilibrium. This is Y equilibrium because you cannot expand it. If you expand it to the left, then this guy, the rightish, will continue to say his views, and somebody, the, the middle guy, a woman, will move to another position, and there will not be a consensus. So that's another equilibrium in this case. What game theory would say here? Now, game theory here, what, the question is what is a game here? And let me here, I want to mention the Bre 52, which is a notion that came after the, 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 the Nash revolution of non-cooperative game theory, which is in a very, so the Bre had in mind that actually it's not, you cannot take, given that other people do something, so let's say in the standard strategy game, the set of options, actions that I can take is fixed. It does not depend on the other players. What is dependent on the other players is my payoff, my utility, right? The bread idea that actually what is for uh, the actions that I can take do depend also on the actions of the other player, and that's brought in to the concept of social equilibrium, which is basically in this case will not be different than saying that actually if there is disagreement, if there is no consensus, my utility is minus infinity. Okay, something like that. So if you, do, you, you, you take this, uh, this game, then of course, if you take the game with minus infinity utilities and so on, then there will be an equilibria with disagreement. That's fine. Maybe just I cannot, uh, if there are three players, not two, then there will be equilibrium with non-agreement because I cannot achieve consensus by just moving myself. Um, um, uh, uh, that's uh, the case, but also, of course, there will be also uh, equilibria, this, equi this will be also an equilibrium, because actually if the consensus is important, then even the positions which are outside the range of the positions are left to be equilibrium, a la the game theoretical analysis. What is probably more interesting is to look at what we call the majority uh, economy. And the majority economy is the same story, but this time the feasibility is not a consensus, but feasibility we need a majority. We need a majority of people who say the same thing. The other people can say whatever they want. Okay, is it clear? 
Notice again, it's they don't care about the outcome in the standard sense, they care about the position they express. Now, in this case, let's first of all analyze the, 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 the Y equilibrium. The Y equilibrium here would be the following. There would be, in this case, there would be exactly two Y equilibrium. Exactly two Y equilibrium. This is, of course, one and the other one will be the other, the, the symmetric one. So the middle to the left are permitted. This is the, the set Y. What are the choices? Everybody from the middle to the left expresses his ideal point. Everybody to the right of the middle, well, they are not allowed to be expressed rightish positions, they choose M. There is a majority, exactly. Uh, of course, I assume that the number of agencies is odd, so there is exactly a majority, and of course, M is the, the, the median, okay? So the set Y cannot contain two points, a power equilibrium cannot contain two points, one to the right of the median, one to the left of the median. Because why? Because if it contains a point to the right of the median, to the left of the median, because of convexity, it includes also the median. So the median woman in this case will choose the median. The people to the right of the median will choose a point to the right of the median. And the people from the left will choose to the left and there will not be a majority. So no power equilibrium will include two points, one to the right, one to the left of the median. So every, pi, every y equilibrium must be either from the median to the left or from the median to the right, and therefore there are only two y equilibrium here, equilibria here, and this is one, and the other one is the, 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 the parallel. If you want the outcome here is indeed the, the, the median, uh, you have here a median theorem here, that the outcome is indeed the median because of reasons which are very different from the standard reasons. Now what game theory would say here? Game theory would say here that everything could be equilibrium. Choose any point, could choose any point, assign a majority, exactly if there are seven people, assign four people to express this view, give the other people to choose their peaks, this is equilibrium. Because the three people are in the peak, the four people just are afraid to the fragility of the society and they cannot move on. So the, the game theoretical analysis here will say almost nothing. I'm not saying that it's right or wrong model. There are two stories and the stories are very different. I think that this is a good example to demonstrate how this analysis is different than the standard, standard game theoretical analysis. Um, I have time, 10 minutes, five minutes, give and take. Give and take, that's my, uh, actually, this is, uh, we thought that we invented it, but apparently a very clever guy with the name Yves Promont uh, invented this uh, economy before us. And, um, and again, just to remind you, you have to choose a number between minus one and one. Uh, positive is you take, negative you give. The constraint, the sum has to be zero. Every agent has a peak, has a convex preferences over the set X, namely a strict convex, namely as a single peak and going right and left, no, not necessarily symmetrically. Now, let's say that the sum of the peaks is equal to zero. We call it heaven. Everybody does the best and it's possible and that's fine. The problem, of course, is that we are not in heaven. By the way, some people want to give like they follow Jesus. Uh, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Some people follow this uh, band. By the way, it's a beautiful, movie, a beautiful song. And the name of the song is Better to Take Than to Give. Um, such is life. There are some people like that, some people like that. And, uh, but uh, let's assume that actually the situation is uh, some of the peaks is positive. Namely, more people on average wants to give, uh, not more. The, the, the total demand to take is larger than the total supply to give. In this case, again, there will be unique equilibrium. <clears throat> there will be unique equilibrium and it will be also Pareto efficient. Let me prove it, it's quite simple. Again, my picture. So here are the five guys and these are the peaks three wants to take, two wants to give. Not enough to give to supply the demand. Take the set Y, think about the set Y to be from minus one to some M. So let's start to actually with very large M. Let's say that everything is allowed. 
if everything is allowed, that everybody chooses the peak, then there is the sum, by assumption, the sum of the peaks is positive, it's not equilibrium. Let's say that it's only given, it's allowed to give, uh, it's allowed also to take an action between minus one and some m, which is, let's say, a zero. So if the m is very small, then people can just give, and there is a surplus of giving. Now, it's easy to see that this example, when you move the m from minus one to one, you move continuously and increasingly from surplus of giving, a uh, of giving, to surplus of taking, and there must be some point, actually unique point between, which is where actually the demand and the supply are equal. This is also the unique equilibrium. That's equilibrium because you cannot expand it. That's why uh, 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 if you expand it to the right, then because of, again, because of the convexity, then actually you will have also points, which is in this case to the right of point three, and some people will take too much and nobody will take less or give more, and therefore it will not be equilibrium. And it's easy to see that if the left side is not minus one, but it's also, you are allowed to give only up to, let's say, point eight, then actually also the, the point to the right will be to the right of point three, and this will be a subset of this set, and therefore it will not be a Y equilibrium. So there are many Y, para Y equilibrium. For example, if it's allowed only to choose zero, it's a para Y equilibrium. You're not allowed to give or to take. It's a power y equilibrium, but of course, it's not a y equilibrium. Of course, it's Pareto efficient because you cannot change the people in the peak and the other people to improve their situation. You can just allow them to take more and that will not be feasible. So therefore, it's also a Pareto efficient outcome. And finally, the, our uh, division economy, uh, which is the most textbook type of, uh, of example. And, uh, and, and here uh, we have several things to say, but I would like actually just to say one thing here, which is uh, actually I will use this, uh, this uh, picture to demonstrate. Some of you have heard about the notion of egalitarian equilibrium. Egalitarian equilibrium is that you take the E, the initial endowment, you split it equally among the end members and you allow the market to work with competitive. So in this case, everybody has the same initial endowment and therefore in equilibrium, everybody has the same budget, budget set. Now, this budget set, if the choice, so let's say that this is the equilibrium, namely the XI are the best in the, the prices are such that the XI are the best in the budget set and the sum of the XI is exactly equal to to, to E, we are claiming that if at least uh, one of the XI is not in the extreme, namely uh, not in the excess, then this is indeed a Y equilibrium. This is a Y equilibrium because you cannot expand the set. Of course, this is a para equilibrium by definition. You cannot expand the set because if one of the, element, one of the XI will be not on the extreme, if you expand the set, then in, it, it, it must be the case that because of the convexity, and again, there will be a point which will be strictly better than him. Everybody will not be below the line. Some one, at least one guy will choose something above the line, and that's contradicting the feasibility. So unless you have an extreme case that people are only on the excess, then this, this famous egalitarian competitive equilibrium is also, that's the connection in some sense between the standard general, more or less standard general equilibrium uh, concept and our concept, but it's absolutely not the same. In the paper you will find some uh, examples, that, uh, any counter examples that you can think about you will, you will have. There are also equilibria which are, uh, um, there are also equilibria uh, which um, uh, Pareto, which there are also uh, equilibria which are uh, not uh, uh, outcomes of egalitarian equilibrium, which are even Pareto efficient, and there are non Pareto efficient, whatever you want, you can, you can, you can get here. Not whatever. Okay, um, so that's the examples. Uh, now, I apologize to those of you who have heard me uh, in, the in the, my last one minute of this talk, uh, because I just repeat myself again and again whenever I present a paper. This is my conclusion. No conclusions, and this is by purpose, and this is by declaration. I do believe that economic theory papers should not have conclusions. 
I hate conclusion sections in economic theory. I think that usually there is a bunch of nonsense. I have to admit, I, I was sinful at least once. I remember that I was forced by an editor of a very respectable uh, journal, he's not sitting here, don't worry, that, uh, that forced me to, to add some nonsense in the head of a paper, and we, I healed it, and I had it, and I'm really ashamed of what I did. Uh, a, a conclusion, uh, having conclusion sections in economic theory is for me is like that, uh, I mean that, of course, we don't compare ourselves to Chekhov, but uh, imagine that Chekhov at the end of the paper, of his story, sorry, would say uh, conclusions. Or, uh, or external validity, or extensions of the story, or something like that. Since I think that the model in economic theory is just a story, it's not right and wrong, it not, should not be tested, uh, and it cannot be tested, it's just a concept, it's just a story, you can like it, you can hate it, you do whatever you want with it, you can even estimate it if you want, I don't care, <laughs> but, but, but that's not the purpose of this story, and therefore I don't want to have any conclusions. That's what I have to say.